Good afternoon, and welcome to the first webinar for the inaugural round of the Community One Stop for Growth. On behalf of the Baker Polito Administration and Housing and Economic Development Secretary Mike Kinneley, we want to thank you for joining us today and for your interest in supporting and advancing economic growth throughout our state. This series of webinars will introduce you and inform you about this one stop model, which has been developed by the Executive Office of Housing and Economic Development in partnership with the Department of Housing and Community Development and Mass Development to help in the coordination of the Commonwealth's investments in community and economic development. These webinars, webinars have been designed for anyone that's interested in learning about this new process and how to access these state resources. So if you're a municipal official, a stakeholder, a community development practitioner, someone that has a project or an idea of a project uh, that may result in in new housing units for your community, new jobs, safer roads, uh, or any improvements to your communities, then you're in the right place. I'll reiterate the note that this meeting is being recorded. This webinar will be provided in, uh, on our website uh, for those that were not able to join us. Um, and I will also note that there will not be a live Q&A session during this webinar. We invite you to submit your questions through the Q&A function here in WebEx. We will be reviewing these, aggregating them, and posting responses in an FAQ document on the website. Let's move to the next slide. So my name is Juan Vega, and I serve here as the Assistant Secretary for Communities and Programs at EOHB. This first webinar is gonna focus on an overview of the Community One Stop for Growth. We'll demonstrate examples of the old process and how this new program model will work. We'll describe the development continuum, which is a key feature of this one stop, and demonstrate how it relates back to the various grant programs that have been incorporated into the one stop. We will also cover broad descriptions of the expression of interest and the full application and what to expect during this process. The second webinar will delve deeper into the application process with various specific examples of projects and how you would complete a full application. Uh, today, you will also be hearing from my colleagues, Ashley Stolba, who is the Undersecretary for Community Development, and Helena Fruscio Altman, who is Assistant Secretary for Program and Performance Management. I will start with some background. During the listening tour that the Secretary and Lieutenant Governor conducted during 2019, in preparation of our economic development plan, Partnerships for Growth. We heard from a lot of community members, including many of you on this call. And we got a lot of great ideas that were then incorporated into the plan uh, that the governor signed. We also got the ability uh, to learn about challenges that you all were facing. Um, it's important to note that, it's important to note that, um, that when trying to access resources, you uh, described to us difficulties. Um, we also heard that sometimes it's not easy to find information about the programs and that even if you do find the information, um, the, if the community knows about the different programs, it was still difficult to prepare applications uh, with different timelines and different processes. There's also an issue of timing. Which phase you were in in your project might not necessarily align with the next program deadline that's coming up. This feedback was reviewed internally and the secretary challenged us to think about ways to improve this user experience in particular how could we be more strategic and streamlined in the way that we delivered these programs the answers was well, the answer was to create this single application portal with a single timeline and a more streamlined process we added a referral component as well all of this is to align with the economic development plans uh, uh, pillar around building vibrant communities and also in terms of the principle of making government accessible. In our next slide, we wanted to highlight the fact that part of the response from those uh, listening to us was the creation of the Community Compact Connector, which was launched by the Lieutenant Governor. It provides uh, a centralized web page that organizes all of the state's resources for communities to be able to search and find uh, grant uh, opportunities and also understand the calendar that they're all organized under. And then building on that success, we took that and said, okay, let's develop this one-stop model. 
uh, we partnered with DHED and Mass Development uh, to develop the model on how communities would be requesting the grant funding. It's particularly important as the administration moves its focus into recovery efforts post the pandemic. This cross-agency coordination becomes even more important. The Community One Stop for Growth is a single application portal and, an app and a collaborative review process that makes targeted investments based on a development continuum. It's a commitment from the state to streamline the experience for you, the applicants, and to improve the ways that we engage with communities and the ways in which we make grant decisions. It reorients us from being just a passive reviewer and reader of your proposals into an active partner in your economic growth strategy, priorities, and investments. This is a fundamental shift in the way that we, the state, do business, uh, but it's not a, way, a change in the way that you do business. You will still be putting forth your best ideas and your best proposals. As a way to demonstrate this old way that, we, uh, that I've referred to the, and the way we've conducted grant programs, the team prepared this hypothetical project. If we take a housing choice community that is looking to implement a downtown revitalization effort that might require some demolition and brownfields cleanup, and they also want to create a business improvement district to attract investment, and they're interested in studying the feasibility of bringing 300 units of market rate housing to a site. In the old process that would require this community to research and find its way to various grant programs that might help them with the project. A multifaceted project like this would have meant that you had to apply to five different programs, which ran on five different timelines. By the time it was over, you would have answered over 300 questions over a span of five months, and ultimately have, may have gotten mixed results. Maybe you were denied in MassWorks in November because the site was not ready, but you were not able to get support from a, another program like Site Readiness because you missed that deadline. And so this is the way that we, this is the process that we want to change. Now, with the community one stop for growth, the community can put forth this whole project in one application. That represents a 70% reduction in the number of questions that you're answering, the removal of a lot of legacy processes. And the application, the full application, would be read and evaluated by all of the relevant agencies that may be able to make grants to support the project. There is an optional step, which we'll be elaborating further in this webinar, which is the expression of interest. It's optional, but highly recommended. We're asking you to pitch to us up to five project ideas that you have and give the team the opportunity to review those and provide some feedback. Feedback perhaps on uh, programs that you may not have thought about yet, feedback about where you might need to strengthen your narrative to be more competitive in the programs. Um, and all of this would be put forth in June through a full application, which will then be reviewed and provide you, uh, we would then provide you responses based on that full application. I now want to invite my colleague Kalina to talk to us about uh, the next uh, the next part. Thanks, Juan. Hi, everyone. So as we were debating how to implement this community one stop for growth, we debated two different models uh, of implementation. So the first you may know and love, which is MassWorks. Uh, this program actually merged six separate programs that, again, ran on separate applications and timelines into the MassWorks program. In this model, all the other programs went away. They no longer existed as separate pro programs or line items, and just the MassWorks application and authorization existed. The other model was the rental rounds model, also known as the housing one stop. This gives a singular application for 14 separate line items. All of those programs run separately, but do and exist separately, but do accept a singular application. As you're thinking about this community one stop for growth process, you should really relate it more closely to the rental rounds or housing one stop model. All of the programs that are embedded and accepting applications through the one stop still exist. They still have their individual line items 
they have all of the guidance that is included in developing and, and running those programs. You will see both on the One Stop website as well as in our notice of funding availability that you can click on the names of any of these programs and really get a deeper dive into the background, all of the guidance that you would find for that will guide these programs. Again, this is very similar to how the rental rounds or the housing one stop is run. So on the next slide, you will see the programs that will be accepting applications through this singular portal. So we're very excited to have 10 programs in this first year launch with the one stop. So through the Executive Office of Housing and Economic Development, there's the MassWorks program and the Urban Agenda program, as well as the 43D Expedited Permitting program, which is a designation and not a grant program. Additionally, the Department of Housing and Community Development will be administering its Housing Choice Capital Grants and its Mass Town Downtown Initiative through the One Stop. And then we have two new additions from DHCD. The first is the community planning grants. This uh, you will see as we start to go through the development continuum that um, these, uh, that you will have a new opportunity to submit a planning grant uh, 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 applications. And additionally, we have a rural development fund that will help our rural and small towns further their development projects. Both of these were authorized in the new economic development bill that was just signed. Additionally, Mass Development joins the team with their Brownfields Fund. This is their grant programs for municipalities, as well as the Site Readiness Program. These programs um, that we know and love will also be uh, joined by a new program author also authorized in the Economic Development Bill, the Underutilized Properties Program, and this will help us develop some of our underutilized properties in the Commonwealth. So as we are starting to put this new process into place, we really want to help you think about, well, where do I start? What do I do? So if you see this section in yellow under the applicant, this is you. So what you should really be thinking about is, what are my economic development goals? What is the big picture of what I'm trying to achieve in my community? And then also, what are the key priority projects in my community that I would like to further, particularly this year, but you know, this one stop is here to stay, so in future years as well. How do you communicate those to us? Well, we get, we're giving you two opportunities. The first is the expression of interest, and then in the full application. In every single time you hit submit in one of these um, applications, um, we get to see not only what the project is, but we get to see that couched in your full economic development goals. We provide opportunities in this process for you to spell that out for us. So again, we're not just seeing a bit and a piece of your overall goals, but we can see how this project really does fit into the bigger picture. And once you hit submit, then it's our turn. So that's the blue section of this slide. So then we go in, we review all of the materials, we give you guidance, um, and we see what, what we can do to partner with you. We then work together behind the scenes across agencies to really have a discussion, not just again about a singular project, but about your goals and how those projects fit in. That will then result in a decision. You know, you are applying for funding, but regardless of whether those awards are accepted or declined, we will be also referring your project to other relevant programs. We know again, uh, going back to what Juan said at the beginning in the background, we heard about how hard it is to navigate all of our programs, be informed about them. So we are automatically referring any of your projects to relevant programs that may connect you to additional funding sources through this process. With that, I'm gonna kick it back to Juan um, to talk a little bit more about the development continuum. Great, thank you, Helena. So we'll spend a little bit of time here uh, reviewing this development continuum. You will hear about it a lot 
during the webinars. You will also see it prominently featured in the NOPA. And it's important uh, to note that the entire this entire one stop is built around this idea of this development continuum. And as reference, I would what may, uh, what comes to mind is for those of you that have applied in the past to MassWorks or maybe Site Readiness or Brownfields, I'm sure that you've heard from more than one of us uh, in in the many years uh, about your project not being ready. And you'll you also hear a lot about shovel readiness um, and defining that. This is this graphic is our way of describing um, and providing clarity around how we see readiness in the in the big picture, if you will. Um, this represents the life cycle uh, of a development project uh, and the various phases. Um, the, it also shows the steps that we believe are needed in order to build up to any type of development that you may be trying uh, to carry out. So we're asking you to think about your projects and your community in this life cycle. Where are you in the life cycle of your project? Where are you in the life cycle of your planning? Um, what is it that you need today? What is it that you need in the next year to move the needle and build your way up uh, to uh, the larger projects uh, that you're trying to accomplish? So as you're starting out and thinking about uh, what might be possible, um, this is uh, kind of think about the, the proverbial build it and they will come scenario where you're trying to put pieces in place that'll get you to, um, uh, to attract a developer to bring housing or to bring new jobs uh, which your community needs. So we want you to consider and think about um, where you are in terms of preparation. The left-hand side of this graphic, uh, we've organized these categories into the preparing for growth. And think about this in terms of communities, if your community doesn't have yet a developer, for example, identified or a, speci a specific project that it will be putting in place. However, you do have ownership of a handful of parcels that would be prime for some development, or you have some, uh, some other uh, projects uh, that uh, some districts, some zoning changes that you think need to be made, et cetera. We see you coming into these categories, either uh, the community capacity building in particular, um, and I will go into some more detail on how these uh, can be thought of. Um, but the right-hand side of this uh, graphic is where we see projects that have now uh, are ready to actually catalyze a development. This is usually the case where you have a developer identified or where uh, a community or the actual applicant uh, has a housing development for which it has lined up some financing and needs um, and has a gap. Um, this is usually and the way that we administer at MassWorks in particular uh, comes into play like this. We usually see ourselves as that final piece of the puzzle to kind of close the, the deal, to close the loop on being able uh, to put shovels in the ground. Um, and so in this, in these three categories, you would be coming in in the pre-development and permitting where you actually have a site identified or you're ready to do some capital improvements for building, or of course you're ready to do infrastructure um, uh, and, and uh, into public, uh, to publicly owned assets. So moving on, we'll walk through now. Um, the, this next slide actually, we wanted to also do a crosswalk to demonstrate then how we, all the, the entire team, looked at all the available programs that we were bringing into the One Stop and mapped out how we were going to be able to support each of the items on this continuum. And so this graphic represents um, the various resources that we think uh, can be aligned to support a community wherever you are in this continuum. Um, and so that'll help us leverage uh, some of these and pair up some of these. There may be opportunities where um, there are multiple sources that are being uh, brought to bear on a project. Um, I would also point out that this list, as Selena mentioned, includes some new items that are now up and running uh, that came from the Economic Development Bond Bill, which definitely expand our capacity to support communities around the planning stage, as well as the implementation st uh, stage. Um, as you'll know, programs, the two new programs, particularly around housing choice and rural development, um, are 
very uh, flexible and, and able to support a lot of communities that uh, have those designations in any of the categories across the country. So now we'll get into a little bit uh, more detail um, on the continuum. So the capacity building is the very first uh, category. Capacity building, these are for projects uh, that maybe focus on a district, uh, uh, a particular neighborhood, a region, or a target population. This is for when you're thinking about, um, you want to start um, thinking about developing a major project in your community, but you've got to bring your stakeholders together. This is where we see you bringing together uh, a coalition or a consortium. You're inviting the chamber. You're inviting some of your key nonprofits. The municipality is playing a lead role, um, et cetera. And so we'd be looking for projects that would be uh, either doing technical assistance around uh, downtown or this early stage development. And so I would invite you to think about, for those of you that have taken advantage and benefited from the down, Mass Downtown Initiative, for example, where you've gotten support around developing a parking plan or manage a parking management or um, some type of marketing plan for your downtown, this is where you would still be able to get that resource. You would propose a project uh, that would be seeking technical assistance for improving a downtown in the same vein that you would have applied to the Mass Develop uh, uh, to DHED for the MDI program. It's just that now it's going to be reviewed by the MDI folks as well as the rest of us to see to what extent it's tied into this broader strategy and how we can be more helpful. In the next category is planning and zoning. And this is an area where you're now, you've now developed some of that capacity. You've got your working group, you've held some public meetings, you've gotten You've worked through maybe some of the controversy with the project sometimes, uh, which is inevitable. Uh, you're now ready to put forth some actual zoning changes or actual, you know, you maybe you maybe you're just starting out. You want to put together a master plan or a housing production plan. You're not sure yet what a project might look like in the future, but you want to put in place some of these best practices uh, that are going to prepare your community for that growth that you're seeking. And so if you're looking to do a land use plan, a downtown plan, things like that, this is the category you would come in uh, to. Again, similar to what you would do with, uh, with the zoning, uh, I'm sorry, with the MDI, but also this is where we're going to begin to leverage these new planning grants coming from the bond bill. In the next category is site preparation. Again, keep in mind that up to here, we're still in the stage where you are not yet sure what the actual development looks like. You're trying to position your community, position yourselves uh, to be able to take advantage uh, of these uh, larger grants and larger programs. In this category is where we're working, uh, you're working to progress the actual site um, uh, towards development. Um, you're trying to develop a marketing plan to attract developers. Maybe you will need some help uh, putting together bids. Uh, this is where you might do a market study see what kinds of uh, things might be appropriate, uh, either that fit within your zoning or fit within what your plans are for the community. Um, it's also where we would be distributing uh, resources around Brownfields cleanup. Again, preparing these sites uh, for the potential development. So again, if you normally have gotten resources from Brownfields or site readiness in the past, you will do exactly the same thing. You would put forth your project, you would still be um, expected to provide the narrative and explanation and making the case or making the argument for why your project is strong uh, in this competitive process. Um, and this section is where you would come in for those initial, uh, requesting those initial investments. So now we move into the second half of that continuum where now you probably have attracted a developer uh, or you are the developer. Um, uh, and or you're the community development organization that is trying to partner with a few people to develop some housing. Um, in this category, we would expect you to have identified the actual site, um, identified the development, um, even if it's just in the beginning stages, but the fact that a developer has been selected, if you're, if you put this out for RFP or if, or if a developer has approached you to partner, uh, the point here being that now you've got actual people in place that are going to activate uh, the development. And so in this category, you'd be looking for that pre-development, that permitting. You're now ready uh, to start developing engineering reports. Maybe you're doing uh, surveying, you're doing additional feasibility. 
Um, if you're dealing with buildings and there's a seismic code assessment that's needed, this is where you would come in. Um, and as you see, we organize these into either pre-development because you're developing a building or pre-development if you're doing public in, uh, a site or infrastructure. And so we've organized the application um, and you would be telling us which, which of these categories and which of these uh, particular items you'd be looking for funding for. This includes due diligence process, the pro forma development, et cetera. Again, this, you know, if you've done, uh, made these requests of site readiness in the past, uh, uh, this is, again, you would do the same here. Uh, MassWorks will be able to, because of the flexibility we have in MassWorks, we'll be able to begin entertaining some of these requests for this early, uh, uh, this early uh, develop, pre-development and permitting work. Um, and then the bond build now gives us this underutilized properties resource uh, that will be leveraged to carry out some of the activities uh, in this category. In the next category, we've now moved into these final two categories where you now have, you, you have an address, you have a building, you have an actual site, you have a developer, you've got yourself some design work done, you're now more advanced. Um, we'd be looking, and, and we'll describe this more in the next webinar, you know, we're looking for things that are now at 50 or 75% design uh, set. Uh, ready to move forward. You're, you're now coming in um, with uh, uh, specific uh, needs around uh, the, the, the carrying out, um, and in this case, the uh, activation of underutilized properties, which is coming out of the bond bill, as has been mentioned. These are going to be capital grants for construction ready projects. Um, and the building has been secured, you have site control, identified the end use, you're going to be asked what the public purpose is, etc. Um, and again, we'll get more into details on this in the next webinar. The NOFA is also a place you want to focus on as far as understanding uh, the various elements that are going to be needed in order to be able to put forth a competitive project in this category. And then finally, we have the infrastructure category. And I would just, I meant to distinguish, so we consider the previous category kind of vertical construction, and this last category is the anything horizontal uh, construction. And this is where you would, for many of you that have applied to MassWorks in the past, this is your traditional MassWorks project. This is publicly owned infrastructure. You're trying to make improvements. You're, you're extending water and sewer uh, to activate a site for development. You're trying to make roadways safer. You're trying to address a culvert that is, has, you know, is, is in danger of collapsing or has collapsed um, and, or public utilities. And again, it's similar to how we manage MassWorks today. It'll be the same in the one stop. We would be looking for the private, uh, the public investment that is being sought to directly support and leverage private investment. You, would be, you will be asked about the private development, uh, how many housing units, how many jobs, et cetera, which is what you would normally be asked in a, in a MassWorks application. And I will uh, add, and I see in terms of questions around STRAP, STRAP is included here. It'll be just the same as it's always been with MassWorks. There will still be a set aside um, for in the MassWorks uh, budget uh, for STRAP projects, um, which are um, uh, for any type of roadway safety projects, um, I will reiterate that as we always do in MassWorks, we are the most competitive strap applications are those that are making a strong uh, argument and a compelling argument around the need to fix the road because of public safety concerns um, or dangerous uh, conditions, et cetera. Um, I will add, however, that because of the additional resources in the one stop related to the Rural Development Fund, um, there will be additional uh, considerations um, and almost an expansion, if you will, of the, our ability to support strapped communities for these type of projects. And finally, as I, and, and, and as I was just saying, the Rural Development Fund, as well as Housing Choice, um, is a particular uh, a unique part of this one stop that is providing us the opportunity to uh, really leverage dollars that are destined uh, and dedicated to these particular categories. But for you, the applicants, if you are a rural and small town uh, or small town or your housing designated community, um, that will be um, uh, represented in the application when you apply. And that'll dictate 
the ability, your ability to be, have access to the additional resources in the application. I would note that any housing choice designated community um, currently designated or, will, or to be designated over the next few months um, will have the opportunity to uh, access the regular resources in the application, but also access capital grants that are destined only for housing choice communities. Um, so you'll essentially be looked at twice, if you will, uh, as you put yourself into the categories. But also we're going to be providing the opportunity that if you don't have a pro if your project you don't feel fill, fits directly into that uh, into the continuum, there will be the opportunity to submit a special project uh, if you're a housing choice community uh, for that additional consideration. And similarly for the rural and small development, uh, uh, rural uh, and small towns. Um, again, that consideration for being a small and rural small town will be applied to all the categories. All of the funding sources in this one stop will give particular consideration uh, to rural and small towns, not only because of the rural development fund coming out of the bond bill, but because it is a top priority of this administration to support and bring development in all corners of the Commonwealth. And that brings us to looking at small communities um, and rural towns uh, in terms of being able to enjoy and access these resources. Um, and to the extent that you are activating yourselves and you are preparing yourself for growth, utilizing the various tools that are available to you, we wanna be a partner in helping you advance those goals. To summarize uh, the process overall, um, as, uh, as we've been talking about, this expression of interest is optional it is not a requirement in this process, but it is highly recommended. You would be, you will be asked to submit to us some. It's a short form. You will be asked to describe to us a little bit about what your goals are, what kinds of things you've been working on, and then describe very short, uh, in, in very brief ways, what up to five different projects that you have in mind that you think you want to proceed, and and give us an indication of where you think you might fall in the cat in, in the categories. A team will take that and will review that and provide some feedback on whether you're looking at the right categories, how do you strengthen the full application. Ultimately, all of these projects, in order to be considered for a grant, need to come in with a full application. And as you'll see, the full application then uh, opens up into the various categories that you will be submitting in. Once all of that is submitted, I would note that June 4th is the deadline for submitting a full application. Um, they will go into the collaborative review stage where all of the three agencies, as well as other state agencies, will be part of reviewing, scoring, uh, evaluating uh, the, the various applications based on the each of each program's respective guidelines. Um, and in both the expression of interest stage and in the final collaborative review stage, there'll be opportunities for us to potentially refer you to additional programs that you may not have thought about yet, or you may not be aware of. I would like to now pass it on to my colleague, Ashley, who will talk to you about the application outline. Thank you so much, Juan. My name is Ashley Stolba, and I am the new Undersecretary of Community Development at the Executive Office of Housing and Economic Development for the Commonwealth. And I am so excited to be here, and I'm excited to work with you as we launch the one-stop process I'm even more excited to help bring your help, help bring your priority projects to life. So the idea behind the one stop is to shift from the Commonwealth from just being a funding provider to being a partner with you to further your economic development goals. This new process is going to help us work better together to achieve our shared objectives, targeted, smart, equitable opportunities across the Commonwealth. So how do we actually do that on the website? So when you enter the portal, you will see two opportunities, the expression of interest and the full application. The first part of the process, what we are calling the expression of interest, it's optional, but highly recommended. It's a short application where you will tell us your overall economic development goals and the priority projects you would like to progress this fiscal year. The expression of interest is hugely beneficial to all of us because it allows us to understand the project in greater context of your overall goals rather than just in a vacuum. We will then be able to provide you with guidance for when you prepare the full application. You'll be able to submit up to five expressions of interest beginning February 8th. Then you will see the full application. This is where you will actually submit your application for funding review. 
Unlike the expression of interest, you can submit an unlimited amount of full applications. We're able to access the full application now, you can start drafting at any time, but you will only be able to hit send and submit between May 3rd and June 4th. One thing to remember, a project must be focused on a singular geographic area. So if you have different addresses or different sites, that will require each a separate full application. You'll see two examples here on the slide. Another example would be if you have a building downtown that you'd like to add sprinklers to, and then a different site on the outskirts of town that need cleanup. Those are two separate applications. We'll go through some more examples at the next webinar next week. So let's go into some detail on the expression of interest. So as we've said, it's optional, but it's highly recommended. This is our chance to see the big picture of your economic development goals and background and to understand what it is you are trying to achieve. It also allows us to provide you with guidance for when you work on the full application. So the first, app, the first section is super simple. Um, it's just contact information and background information. The second asks for a little bit more detail about your goals and the tools you've already implemented. And then the final section is where you outline the high level details of your project. Again, you can do this for up to five projects. We do suggest that you get your expression of interest applications in early. That way, you can receive our feedback in a timely way, and you have the maximum amount of time to craft your full application. Either way, even if you don't do it super early, we will get a response to you um, in advance of the full application submission period. So let's go over to the next slide on the full application. So again, this is the actual application that you will submit for formal review for funding. The full applications are comprised of two components the core and the additional questions based off the part of the development continuum for which you're applying for funding. The core includes basic contact information as well as the goals and some background. This is the same exact thing that you would have already filled out in the expression of interest if you did it. So this will help save you time. Then the application will ask for summary information about your project then more detailed information regarding timelines, leadership, anticipated outcomes, things like that. Then if you are submitting an application to areas further down the continuum, including site prep, pre-development and permitting, buildings and infrastructure, you will also be able to include more details about the location that will be developed. Every application will be required to fill out the four questions. So let's get into some more detail on the additional questions on the next slide. Depending on what part of the continuum you submit, you will have to answer some additional questions related to your project. They'll always include scope and budget, and will include specific questions related to that part of the continuum. So let me provide an example. Say you'd like to clean up a brownfield site under site preparation. In that case, we're going to ask you questions related to contamination of the site. Or let's say you're applying for an infrastructure grant. In that case, we're going to ask you for the private development. We'll get into some more specific examples at next week's webinar, but this should give you kind of an idea of what we're talking about. So each section has a unique set of questions that will help us assess the readiness of your project in that category of funding. Now I'm going to let Juan describe the review criteria of the One Stop and Related Program. Great. Yep. Thank you very much. Oop. Thank you very much, Ashley. Um, so I think, uh, as was mentioned, uh, we are looking to we are incorporating all of these programs into this One Stop, and the applications that are all submitted through the One Stop will be reviewed by program staff to determine. Um, where it may be best suited in terms of the applicant's objectives. It is important to note that each of the, uh, I, I think as Helena had mentioned, the individual programs will remain in place. We're not merging or doing any type of statutory change to the programs. Uh, and therefore, each of the programs will still have, uh, will still be evaluating your application based on the guidelines and criteria that the programs have always used. However, for the one stop, we've developed this uniform or this universal uh, uh, set of criteria that will apply to all of the programs uh, and all the applications that we review. We do want to understand if the program is achievable um, in terms of its scope, um, is it feasible and achievable. Uh, the ability to execute uh, uh, and the leadership, uh, there'll be questions around who is involved in the project, are there all the right uh, the key players that are involved. Um, the uh, the timeline um, is certainly something that's going to be universal for all of these. And as I spoke about earlier about readiness, um, it's going to be important to understand where the project is and are you prepared to actually carry out uh, the proposed uh, activities. 
we're going to be uh, examining your budgets. Uh, is there, uh, are these budgets reasonable? Are the costs uh, uh, re directly related to the project? Um, while in most cases, there, uh, a match will not be required, um, I think for many of our programs, we do give a preference uh, to projects that are leveraging um, out, uh, uh, funds outside of the grant and certainly outside of the state. There may be uh, match funds from local government, um, uh, from, from philanthropy in some cases, there may be federal dollars involved. Um, and so all of that bodes well in terms of the way that we will look at an application, particularly because it demonstrates a buy-in or a commitment uh, from the local municipality um, and, or, or the applicants in particular. There's also gonna be a focus on the outcomes and the impact. And you'll see in the full application and all the sections, we do ask you about what the intended outcomes are. Uh, what do you expect the impact to be for your community and how it ties back to the goals that you've set for the community or for your organization. Um, the impact uh, that it'll have on the community, the impact it'll have on your constituents or your target population um, will be looked at. Um, equitable opportunity is a key component of our economic development plan. And therefore, looking to see how that project advances equitable opportunity um, will be a measure. And is also, as we have done in MassWorks and many of our programs in the last year, we have incorporated some additional uh, questions and, and uh, requirements around climate resiliency and ensuring that the investments that we're making are helping to advance the climate resiliency of the Commonwealth in general, uh, that the community understands, for example, if there are flooding risks and what are they doing to mitigate that, but also more importantly, how is the design of your project being uh, informed by the potential risks going forward uh, over the next few decades. And then certainly progress to date and commitment from the community will be an important factor. We'll be looking for that past activity. In the course section, you'll be asked about what kinds of things you've done in the past five years, uh, et cetera. And so to the extent that your community has availed itself of the tools and development uh, for that the Commonwealth offers, uh, has done a lot of planning, uh, et cetera, uh, that'll, that'll certainly be a, a key component as we evaluate these applications. In the next slide, we try to, uh, it, this is an important slide uh, for anybody on this call in any of these webinars, and that relates to eligibility. I will say again that the individual grant programs that are now incorporating to the one stop will remain as programs with their respective requirements around eligibility. So if you, you've always been eligible for MassWorks, you are still eligible for MassWorks. If you've always been eligible for project readiness, then you, then you will still be able to access those programs. We've tried here to map that out uh, visually so that you all uh, can see, think about what type of organization you are and where you fall. Um, this one stop it is what is, is open to much more than municipalities. Uh, we are uh, looking certainly to the municipalities who are eligible for all of the categories, but then there are gonna be cases where pu other public entities uh, redevelopment authorities, housing authorities, um, and other uh, quasi-governmental organizations may be able to access a lot of these resources. It's also being open to non-public entities, right? You, you'll be, we'll have nonprofits, community development organizations, uh, for-profits, developers, and others that may be able to access um, uh, some of these resources. Again, defined by the individual um, guidelines of the programs. Um, what I would probably add here that this is an opportunity as well that even if you your type of organization may not necessarily fall in a particular category, that is an opportunity then for you to partner with a municipality if, if a municipality is eligible, and and really put forth these multifaceted you know more complex projects um, that uh, can be uh, that can help the community advance its goals. It, 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 the, the issue here for the one stop is who can be the lead applicant and who can be the recipient of these state dollars. Um, that is what we're trying to define here in these uh, in terms of eligibility. Um, but in no way are we dictating the ability for all of you 
to partner, to bring together developers with the nonprofit sector, the CDCs, and the municipal officials, and carry out important development projects that are going to advance growth um, in all parts of our Commonwealth. With that, I will now pass it back to my colleague, Helena, who will talk to you a little bit more about the referral process. Great. Thanks, Juan. Uh, so we just wanted to take a moment to dive a little bit deeper into this referral process. So there's going to be two opportunities uh, for this referral process to happen. So the first is in the expression of interest and then in the full application for as many as applications as you submit in that full application process. So what we will be doing is again, reviewing what you're trying to achieve with your project. And also in some cases, what your community is eligible for in other um, programs. So we have already, all of the programs listed on this slide are waiting and ready for uh, your projects to be given to them. So all of them have signed up and said, yeah, I mean, if something comes through the one stop, we are excited to see the project, talk to the applicant, and discuss how our program may be a better fit or another fit um, for funding for this project. So this is, I'm just gonna give you a couple of examples. So if you are trying to achieve something in your downtown, but it also happens to be related to small business, we may be sending you over to mass growth capital. Or if you're a C-facing community and you have an infrastructure project, we may you know, give you over to the Seaport Council and see if they have some opportunities to help you do um, what you are trying to achieve. Finally, if there's something that you're trying to do that's related to placemaking, maybe Commonwealth Places is a better uh, fit for what you're trying to do, and maybe there's a crowdsourcing angle um, where you could start to explore some of these other programs. So that's just a high level examples of some of the ways that we may be thinking about looking at your programs and then giving a direct pass off to both you saying, hey, did you know about this program? You should check these out, but also really going to the program manager and saying, listen, we understand this community's overall goals and we really think you should take a look at the projects that they have and have a deeper discussion with them to understand if they fit within your program. So again, the benefits of the one stop go beyond 10 programs that we are integrating this year and really trying to say, okay, how do we as economic development and let's also say beyond, this will also be reaching into other secretariats as well, really say, you know, how do we help our communities implement these projects? There's so many pools of funding. And again, going back to the fact that we know it's hard to navigate all of the funding that is available, we wanna take that step on your behalf. Again, I just wanna say, this is an automatic process. There's nothing you have to do besides hitting submit on any of these applications for this process to happen. So now I just wanna give you a little bit more of a runway um, to ex on about what to expect over the next couple of months. You are presently participating in the first virtual session. So you'll see that is the first and recommended step for the one stop is to watch all three of these virtual sessions. This is the overview session. And then next week, we will be going through example after example after example of how your projects can fit into the one stop. We highly recommend that um, that webinar as well. And then finally, we'll be doing a technology webinar with Agate, our, our online application provider. And this will help you navigate the online application that is really the way that you interface with the one stop. Then on February 8th, the one stop will expression of interest will be open and you will be able to submit your expression of interest through April 2nd. We will then be responding literally as you hit submit, we will be reviewing them on a weekly basis and getting back to you with our guidance. We will also be reviewing all of the agencies listed here will be reviewing your expression of interest. This is when the first step in that referral process that I just went into detail about will happen um, as well. And then we will also really be giving you the guidance on, hey, you know, this you're in the right part of the continuum more. Did you think about this? Or really giving you the guidance to guide your full application process and strengthen your applications. Um, because the full application is when we're actually reviewing for funding. Um, 
then uh, you have access today to the full application. So if you sign into Agate, you will see that full application. You can poke around, you can start drafting, you can read the full application um, right now. That said, you cannot submit it right now. So you will be able to submit between May 3rd and June 4th. And that's when you can simply just hit submit and then it hits our formal list of who to review. But you do have an entire month to sort of hit that submit button. But again, you can be readying your project in the system now. Um, once you do hit submit and we stop submitting applications, we then go into our review and app, um, evaluation phase. We may come back to you with questions at, at this point if we need some clarifications, but mostly we will be doing our reviews and our collaborative reviews across agencies, making sure that we're understanding your projects um, as they are submitted. We'll then be escalating those to make sure that we get the proper approvals and then we hope to be able to notify you about your award in mid fall. Again, similar to how we do the MassWorks and many of our other programs, similar timeline there. Um, we will also um, be doing another referral process at that point. And then we will go into contracting and reporting. You can consider this part business as usual. So the exact dates that I just mentioned, you can find those in two places, both the One Stop website spells these dates out precisely as does the Notice of Funding Availability. We know these, uh, these dates are really important. Um, again, we suggest you submit your expression of interest. That's the next thing on the list. We suggest you get it in early and then really be thinking about and crafting those full applications ready to submit. In May and June. So that's an overview. And then you should think about it that next year we will be starting this process over again as the one stop will continue to be implemented year after year. So this is what you can expect over the next couple of months. Um, so with that, I am going to hand it over to Ashley to bring us home. Thank you, Helena, and thank you to you on behalf of the Baker Polito Administration and the Executive Office of Housing and Economic Development Secretary, Mike Keneally, we really appreciate your participation in this webinar so much. As you can see on this slide, we think there are quite a few benefits of the one-stop process. Let me just highlight a few. First, it's the ease of applying to more than one program at once. We also took quite a bit of time to make the process much more streamlined by cutting questions and redundant processes. Finally, we are so excited to partner with you to understand and develop your goals for economic development and to do so together as we collaborate across state agencies to support our communities. So we do see all of your questions coming in. Thank you, keep them going. Also, if you, the webinar ends and you have more questions, please send them to our email address. It's one stop at mass.gov. So that's spelled out one stop at mass.gov. Answers to all questions that we receive through the webinar and through the email will be posted on our website, which is www.mass.gov forward slash one stop. So we look forward to seeing you at next week's webinar, which will be held on Tuesday, February 2nd at 12 p.m. There we're going to get into more detail on the application guidance, and we're going to run through a bunch of specific examples of how your projects may fit into the development continuum and on the one stop. So thank you again for your participation and we hope to see you next week.